God is good all the time. Yes, he is. God is good all the time. One of the reasons why God is so good is because he is beyond our comprehension, but within our comprehension. And there's nothing, not one thing that God doesn't meet us in. We've been talking about the names of God, and today we're going to talk about one of those names, which is Elohim, Hebrew word God uses to describe himself. And I think what is really important, and I have emphasized this already, but I want to emphasize it more and more as we go through this series. This series is about us knowing him. Knowing who he is, knowing how he moves and operates, knowing his distinct attributes, knowing how we experience him in our life, not just as a head knowledge, but as something that is in our heart and in our feet and in our words that come out of our mouth. And the only way that it'll be like that is if we actually know him. And my, my prayer as we've been going through this series, is that each of us would know him more when the series is over. So, names that we've covered already, Adonai, last week, Yahweh, the week before, and Elohim, today. So what does this name Elohim tell us about God? And let me just give you the rough definition, and then we're going to jump into the Scriptures. So, Elohim is a general name for God in the Old Testament. Now, when I say the word God, typically in the context of the Christian faith, we are talking about capital G, God, all right? Elohim in the Old Testament is also used to refer to God or God's little capital G, in the Old Testament. Now this actually becomes a little bit confusing because as translations have gone through this, it, it, it's kind of like, well, what does that mean about the nature of God? Now, the way that I think is a great way to understand this is in the context of a boss. If you have a job, everyone here in the room has a boss. But your boss is not necessarily my boss. And so the word Elohim is generally used in a number of different places in the Old Testament. Of God's, capital G and little g. It's also used in the Old Testament as judges, okay? So sometimes when they're translating, especially in the book of Judges or in Kings and uh, Samuel and some of those places where there were judges during the time of Israel's past, Elohim will be used in those situations. Now, how does this all make sense? Well, it's about understanding the root word for Elohim, and that root word is just the E-L-L, okay, so E-L, and that actually means in the original language of Hebrew is power or might. Now, when Yahweh is referred to in Genesis chapter 1, and it talks about how God created the heavens and the earth, it uses the word Elohim because it is connecting the power that God used to create. Now, Elohim is used throughout the Old Testament but it is particularly common in the book of Psalms. It occurs 404 times in the book of Psalms, and uh, it's used in conjunction with other words like Yahweh and Adonai. We're going to look at that and see how this actually just brings so much more meaning to God's word as we understand these words about who God is, okay? So turn with me over to Psalm 31, Verse 14. And we're going to talk about the implications of Elohim. 
And, and again, this is really about us building a uh, vocabulary so that we can, uh, number one, understand who God is, number two, that we can talk about who God is, and then number three, so that we can actually understand the Scriptures. Because there's a number of places in Scripture, we're going to see this today, where in the exact same verse, there's different names of God that are actually used, okay? Now, I've also, this is another piece of information I just want to share with you. There, I found this Bible translation. It should be on your U version. If you've got a U version app, uh, it's on Bible Gateway. It's not a common uh, printed uh, Bible, but it's a great Bible because it actually it's called the Names of God Bible. Okay, go figure. All right, and it has all of the Hebrew words that are used in the entire Scripture, both the New Testament and the Old Testament, and it actually has those words for you in the text. And it is very helpful if you're reading through, because then you get a full understanding of the meaning. Okay, so let's, let's turn over to this first implication of Elohim, and that is that God is a God of power. He is a God of power. And in Psalms 31, verse 14, this is the Names of God translation. It just says, I trust you, O Yahweh. I said, you are my Elohim. Now, in your English translations, it, this, is what it, this is what it should say. This is, or if you're in an NIV or an ESV, it'll say something like this. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. So what they've done there is they've taken the word Yahweh, which means, just a reminder, okay, we need to be reminded of these things. It means that God is there to satisfy all of our needs. And then it uses my Lord to translate that, which is different than Adonai, which is means my master. And it's also translated into English as my Lord. But then it says, you are my Elohim. And that is translated, you are my God. Now, if we're just reading along and we read, but I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God. We're just kind of like, okay, I get that. There's there's not this all of a sudden, just this explosion of meaning in what this is. But in the original language, Hebrew, which in that context, the Word of God is inerrant, we see that God, it says, I trust you because you are a God who supplies all of my needs. And I said, you are my power. Now, how we understand that, how we practically live that out is a lot more meaningful than just, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. And sometimes we can just kind of ripple through as we're reading and we don't really understand what the psalmist is actually saying. He's saying that I can trust in God because God, God meets all of my needs, and He is a God of power. Now, for some of us, this is just like, well, yeah, I, I know that this is who God is. But do you really know? Because when you say that you trust God, when you actually trust Him, what are you trusting in? Well, you're obviously trusting in the fact that he doesn't lie and that he's trustworthy, but there's something else about his nature and that that he is power. And I love this root word, El, because it, it, it means power and might. It doesn't mean powerful, adding on some kind of adjective to it. It just means that God is power. God is might. And he is our God. He is my God. And I think sometimes we can miss this, practically speaking. We're going through life, just living out our life, and things are happening to us, whatever they may be, whether it's financial, maybe it's a situation that I find myself in. I don't necessarily always tap into the fact that God is power. And then the fact that goes on from this is that this God of power lives inside of me. One of my new prayers as I'm getting older, don't laugh, but you can laugh if you want to, is that God would be my strength. That God would be my strength. 
Now, it has nothing to do with physical weakness or anything like that. It has everything to do with the thing that I rely on. That there needs to be, and I've come to this conclusion, that there needs to be something in our life that carries us along. That's why I've been praying, God, would you give me strength? And that is directly connected to this idea that Elohim is power. He is the God of power, and that God of power rests inside of me. That is why I can trust Him for every need, because He is a God of power. Amen? That's who He is. Now, there are these huge implications, because it means that He's not weak. It means that His strength is more than enough. It means He exceeds in the power of what is needed to be accomplished in your life and in the situations around you. And that's why it's connected to Yahweh. Because His power is sufficient for the needs in our life. And, and this is the most important thing which I think we miss so many times. That God willingly, and we see it in this verse because He says here that you are my personal Elohim. That God gives His children His power. Now when we think about the implications of this, it, it should change everything about our life. Now for, for a lot of us, when we think of power, we immediately think of some kind of boldness, some kind of courageousness to face situations. I want to turn that upside down this morning because that's the power of the world. So when God gives us this power that He has, what does it actually look like? Because I think that's important when we understand that as, as the psalmist is writing this, and he says, I trust in you, Yahweh. I trust in you, the God who's able to supply all of my needs. I trust my Elohim. I trust my God who's my power. You see, when God gives power, we as humans acknowledge our weakness you see it flips it upside down and i think that's the one of the hardest things that we need to learn about who god is is that god's understanding is not the same of the world he says to us his ways are not our ways and our ways are not his ways and god's economy and how god works is upside down to the world so if we want to find this God of power, this Elohim, we need to embrace weakness. <laughs> that is so backwards. It is so backwards from what the world actually teaches. What the world promotes. But God, and He says, and, and how do we know this? Well, we're, we're taught all about this from the apostles in the New Testament. But in the New Testament specifically, we, we see uh, Paul pleading with God about this thorn in his side, this thing that's bugging him, and he's pleading with God. And God says to him, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Your strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. You see, if we really want to get a hold of the power of God, we have to declare our weakness. And yes, we do this when we come to Christ and we come to Him for salvation and we say, oh, I can't save myself. I'm incredibly weak. Would you save me? And then we think, well, now that I'm saved, I can use my own strength. I can use my own power to go about life. But what we see here is that this God, this Elohim, this God of power, only manifests that power in our lives when we are weak. So I want to encourage, and this is kind of, this is almost like turning encouragement upside down. I want to encourage you this morning, and I want to say, hallelujah when you're weak. Okay? Because if we, if we get this perspective that we, we are serving Elohim, God of power, and the way to embrace this power is to embrace weakness. 
That's, that's how we know him. That's how we learn from him. That's how we get to this place where we can say, my Elohim. And I would love for all of us to be able to go out this week. And, and sometimes some of us are in very trying situations. They're, they're overwhelming. And we easily acknowledge our weakness. But that is the place where we actually get to know Elohim. You don't get to know Elohim in this place when you're sort of riding on the mountain and having this victorious thing happening. You get to know Elohim when you are weak. When you don't have that strength and you recognize that you have a need. So let's just embrace weakness, okay? But if you're not willing to embrace it, this is the thing about knowing God. If you don't embrace weakness, you can't know His power. And if you're always in that place of trying to be the strong person, and, and I sort of default into that sometimes. If you're always trying to be that person that's strong, that's got it together, that's showing everything, that I, I'm okay, I'm good, I'm, everything is okay, then you miss experiencing, okay, because this is real. It's not just head knowledge, it's experience. You miss experiencing Elohim, God of power. All right, here's the second implication, and that is that God is a God of hope, okay? So over in Psalm 38, verse 14, the names of God, Bible translation, it just says this, but I wait with hope for you. O Yahweh, you will answer me, O Adonai, my Elohim. Now, if you're going to read that in the NIV or the ESV or some other more modern translation, it, it's, it says this, but you, O Lord, do I wait? It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. You kind of miss all of the deeper meaning that's there. So let's take a moment and unpack this, all right? So it says, but I wait with hope for you, O Yahweh, the God who will supply all of my needs, who is becoming all of my needs. You will answer my master, my power, my God of power. Now sometimes when we're reading, as I said before, and we just kind of skip over all of these English words that we just throw in for these Hebrew words, we miss the importance of why he is able to say, I will wait with hope. I will wait with hope. Well, just, just a, a, a side thing. I, I heard somebody describe waiting as this, and I, I think this is so good. I'm going to try and practice this. Wait. Why am I talking? <laughs> yeah, an acronym, okay? But we, we approach God that way, don't we? When we're impatient, talking to God about all of the things that He needs to do, we're not waiting. Why am I talking? You see, when we wait with God for hope, with hope, we're acknowledging that Yahweh can meet all of our needs. Because why? Because God is a God who gives hope. I have hope because the God who becomes all of my needs is my master. And He is more than a master because He is my powerful master. He is a God of power, Elohim. Therefore, because of all of this, because He is a God who is becoming all of my needs, He's my master, He's my head, He's my power, of course I have hope. Of course I have hope. I cannot have anything else but hope if that's my God. That's the implication of understanding who God is. Because He's going to satisfy everything that I could ever possibly need. He's going to lead me. He's going to bring power into the situation when I am weak. Oh, 
I can't but have hope. So you ask yourself, have I been living this last week? Am I going to live this next week with hope? And if your answer to that question is, well, I'm struggling to find hope in my life, then I would say you're struggling to know God. Now, and again, I don't want to guilt you if you're sort of in this place where you're struggling with living with hope. I, I, and I understand that this is a process. But I want you to understand it's not a process of the world. It's a process of spiritual growth in God. And there's a radical difference. Because if I'm growing in God and I'm knowing who God is and I'm understanding who God is, then of course there's going to be some days when I haven't got it all figured out yet and I may be sort of down on my hope. But if I really am getting to the place where I understand God because all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ to us. So if I'm getting to this place where I'm knowing Him and I'm understanding that He is Yahweh, He is my Adonai, He is my Elohim, I have hope. Because I've been in these weak places where I see His power. I've been in these places where I need His leadership as my Master and I recognize my needs. All of a sudden... This is no longer head knowledge. It becomes heart knowledge. It becomes feet knowledge. It becomes experiential. And all of a sudden, I have hope when maybe the circumstances around me don't look like I should have hope. You see, it's the implication of knowing who God is. You see, when... When we hope in God, it is based on something concrete. And that's why Elohim is so important because something that is concrete is that God is power. It is very concrete. It's His might. It's His capacity to accomplish what He says He will accomplish. Now, I, I actually, I, you know, when I, I just go, oh, I feel so much better. Because in this place of having hope, I don't have to strive. I can actually find rest. I can actually embrace this God of power, and I'm more uh, bold, so to speak, to embrace weakness, because in this place of weakness, understanding that God is Elohim, I have this hope, because it's not me that can do stuff. And yes, we talk about this in the context of salvation, what Christ has done for us on the cross, but we also talk about this in the context of our own sanctification, where we're becoming more and more like Christ. But we also can talk about this in the context of everyday life, the little details that come up day by day. And I can live with hope there because Yahweh, my Adonai, My Elohim is my God who gives me this kind of hope as I wait for Him. And I think this is another important part here as we're talking about this hope. Because as we define hope, hope is this future anticipation of something good happening, which means automatically you must wait for hope to come. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a little... I sometimes have struggle waiting for God to show up. I struggle when I'm kind of like, you know what, God, I wish this thing that is besetting me, this thing that always seems to be there in my spiritual life, would it just go away? (laughs) I just want it gone. Or sometimes it's in the real practical day-to-day life. God, why couldn't my kids just obey me this one time and go to bed when I tell them to go to bed? You know? Oh, I have to wait. I have to wait to see hope brought about. You see, 
when we're talking about Elohim, we have to embrace, to embrace the power, we have to embrace weakness. To embrace the hope, we have to embrace waiting. <laughs> but embracing waiting is easier when you know it's Elohim, a God of power, the God of power. That's who you're waiting on. And I think you may, you may have something in your life right now that's going on and you're just like, oh, I just see, oh, God, I, I wish this would be over. I wish this would be finished. Embrace the waiting. And I know, and I know this is backwards. This is so backwards to what we hear in the world. You know, what we hear in the world is if something is taking too long, then make it happen. Push harder. But what God says, and we can actually do this when we understand that God is Elohim. God says, don't push harder. Wait. Wait. Put your hope in me. I am Yahweh. I am the God who is becoming all of your needs. I'm your master. I am your power. Whoa. Whoa. That's, that's different than the world. But that's what it means to know God. That's what it means to follow Him and embrace who He is. Elohim. Here's the third implication of Elohim, and that is God of reverence. In Psalm uh, 146, verse 2, in the names of God, this is the translation, it says, Hallelujah! Praise Yahweh, my soul. I want to praise Yahweh throughout my life. I want to make music to praise my Elohim as long as I live. Now in the English, it says this, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Now it's obvious when we read it in English that this is a Bible verse that is telling us that we need to praise God. But it actually, in English, doesn't tell us why. It's only in the original language of Hebrews that we get this understanding of why we would praise Him. So going back to the Hebrew and pulling out the Hebrew here, it says, Hallelujah, praise Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh is this meaning where God is becoming all of my needs. Well, that's obvious that there's a why I would want to praise Him because He's becoming all of my needs. And then He says, and and this translation is good. In in, in the English it says, I will, but in the, the names of God version it says, I want to praise Him because we're capturing the why here. I want to praise Yahweh throughout my life I want to make music to my Elohim as long as I live. My power. Now remember, we're not, talk, we're not using the word power in and of itself as its own thing. We're using the word power, and this is how God is using the word power, to speak to Him as power. Well, all of a sudden now, I have a good reason why I should praise Because what I'm now seeing is I'm seeing that all of a sudden I see this God who is able to become all of my needs, who is my power. Well, of course that would be the right response. Of course that I am going to give Him reverence, give Him respect, give Him awe, because He is going to meet all of my needs with His power. Of course I'm going to praise Him. But if we don't understand how God is revealing Himself through His name, then we might not get the why. We need to praise God. And I think this is actually a little bit of a a stretch for us. Do you know that there is no other 
kind of group or assembly that you go to other than a rock concert to sing songs other than church. And one of the hardest things for people, so the majority of people that don't attend church in Canada, is to walk into a group like this and they're singing. Number one, they're singing songs that they don't know. And number two, they're singing. They're just singing. Normal people, normal people just don't sing. We're kind of weird because we sing, okay? And this is actually a hurdle for the unchurched. This is a hurdle for people. Now, of course, there are rock bands. There are people who produce music and songs and lyrics that are catchy, and we listen to them on the radio. Some of us don't sing along to the things on the radio. Some of us do, maybe. But the point being here is what we have in our world is a band that performs and we come along and enjoy what the band plays. They're our favorite songs because we like the Gaelic style of music. We like the Elvis Presley style of music or Johnny Cash or whatever it is. I'm dating myself. Beyonce, okay? You know, for those of us that are younger. The point is, when we gather together and we understand that God is Elohim and we understand what He has done, the needs that He has done in His power that He has met, our response is praise. But in order to praise Him, I must know Him as this kind of God. And what, what ends up happening and it happens in church all the time, is that people don't know God. They really don't know Him. They don't understand who He is. And so, yeah, do I, do I want to sing? Do I want to praise? Do I want to lift my arms and praise Him? Do I want to let the, the, the music move me? You see, if, once you actually know God once you actually know who He is as this God who meets all of my needs and I will wait for Him, I will enter into weakness and I will trust Him that He is going to be that one for me. Praise is the automatic response. Reverence. So I would encourage you, if you struggle with singing, that you would focus in on this God, Yahweh Elohim. Because that is the God that has called us. That's why we worship Him. Because He is a God of power. Because He becomes all of my needs. And in fact, I must, I can't but not praise Him. And that is the response that we have to, towards this God of power. And it's not just a Sunday thing. It's not just something when we gather together in a group, whether that group is on a Sunday, whether it's on a Tuesday, whether it's on a Wednesday, whether it's on a Saturday, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that praise is the thing that's on our lips. And, and I, I want to cause you to reflect. Think about your life. Think about... Did you actually praise God this past week? Outside of gathering together with other believers, did you privately, personally, whether it's driving in your car, maybe listening to the radio or some songs or a CD or Siri, satellite TV, or sorry, not TV, radio, radio. Podcast would be another one, yes. Yes. But did you praise Him? Did, did, did you, outside of being prompted by someone else, but just prompting in the internal thinking of who God is, maybe it was even in your Bible reading this week, or maybe, but that's part of following God. Following Jesus. 
where you spontaneously just praise Him because you know Him. And He is worthy of that praise. That's where learning how to praise actually begins. As we're cutting the grass, as we're doing the dishes, as we're at the end of our day, reflecting on our day, maybe saying a few words to God as we go to sleep. But praise can only happen when I know Him. And knowing Him as Elohim will bring you to this place of praise. This place of reverence. And again, the opposite is true. If you, if you don't know Elohim, you're not going to be praising Him. In fact, what ends up happening, because praise is the attitude of gratitude, okay? Praise is the attitude of gratitude. What ends up happening in our life when we are not worshiping Elohim, when we are not praising God, we become complainers. Who likes living with a complainer? Anybody want to put up their hand? No. Okay? So in order for us to shift, because we're shifting, remember, we're talking about, no, okay, I'm struggling waiting, I'm, I, I'm struggling being weak, and sometimes we're struggling with complaining. And we need to get to the place where we're not complaining, but we're praising. Because why? Because my Yahweh, the one who's going to meet all of my needs, my Adonai, my Master, my Elohim, my power, is going to meet the thing that I'm actually complaining about if I would embrace weakness and put my hope in Him and wait. See how this all just ties together? Because that's exactly what these Scriptures are telling us this morning. They're telling us that if we, if we want to be in this place of knowing God where we're worshiping Him and we're celebrating Him and we're seeing Him do great things in our life, it means that some of this other stuff we need to put off and put on the things of God. So let me encourage you this morning, and, and as you go this week, and, and this, this is going to keep expanding, and, and what's so great about this is that we're growing our knowledge base around the understanding of the Hebrew language about the names of God. But as we move through this, we're going to be actually able to go, because there are Scripture verses that have more than five or six names of God in them. Isn't that cool? And you didn't even know that before. So let us press in to know Him. Amen? Amen? And it starts with a relationship with Jesus, following Him, embracing Him, acknowledging that He's my Savior, and then following Him all the days of my life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank You for Your self-revelation to us about who You are. Lord, I pray that we would actually know You. It just wouldn't be head knowledge, but that it would be real, heartfelt understanding the mystery of God. Lord, I pray that we would know You as Elohim. That you, we would know You as a God of power. That we would embrace the weakness to experience that power. And God, that we would wait on this God of power who brings hope to us because you are a God of power. And God, that we would enter into worship and, and, and not complaining, but enter into worship, enter into reverence, enter in to praise because you are our God of power. So God, we worship you and we praise you because you are a God of power. You are so good. So God, we praise You and worship You for all that You are. 
And we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen.